And again, in school, we're taught, you know, she sat down and then something good happened. But, you know. <laughs> so she yeah. sat down and she was trained in nonviolence. You know, and at the end of her nonviolence training, uh, she said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something, right? So uh, in Montgomery, the bus, the segregated, it wasn't just about segregated buses. When you paid at the bus, if you're an African American, you had to pay, get off, and then get on the back door. And oftentimes, the bus would just speed off with your money, right? So it was a very oppressive state. So the Montgomery bus boycott began when she, uh, you know, sat down in that seat, refused to move because it was a bus driver who had fled with her money before, right? So there's some history there. And the Montgomery bus boycott went on for 381 days. So it wasn't a quick thing. Imagine day 200, 250, still walking miles to work. So it was, you know, these movements were big and, you know, revolutionary and took lots of courage, right? Um, Dr. King was arrested for that movement. Alabama tried to pass laws making carpooling illegal to try to thwart that. Um, so he was involved with that movement. Um, and uh, after that, he was a national figure speaking around the country, you know, Nobel Peace Prize. Now recognized figure on nonviolence. It started the organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which we heard him mention in the speech. Uh, from there, the next major movement was the Freedom Rides, which saw Bernard Lafayette and Snake taking buses deep down to the South, being firebombed. You know, and throughout this time, people were getting killed in the South and lynched. You know, uh, political organizers. It was a very hostile, violent time. Uh, the next major movement was the Selma movement. Because uh, in the Deep South, uh, uh, African Americans could vote technically, but you had to take this like 15 page like math and hit world history exam in order to vote. So you couldn't actually vote. It was very difficult to even vote. And you can find the question, the uh, you know, survey, you know, the uh, things they had to fill out, and all those tough questions online. It's pretty interesting. So they did the Selma movement, in which a number of people were killed. Uh, Dr. King was called uh, in to help lead a march over Edmund Pennis Bridge, which where the police beat back and bloodied clergy people. You know, so lots of violence back then. Uh, so that uh, resulted in the Voting Rights Act, which put protections to make sure all U.S. citizens had the right to vote. And then from there, there's the Birmingham Movement, um, you know, where you remember the kids are getting sprayed with water hoses. They strategically went into that city expecting violence against the state, and they used that violence to gather their national media attention on that conflict. And he went to jail, wrote the letter from Birmingham jail for that. So I just wanted to kind of give that, those are like some of the major movements he was leading. And that was in 1965 in Birmingham. So then in 1966, Dr. King wanted to turn the movement north. He wanted to start addressing economic justice. So him and his staff and his wife and the family, they moved into South Side Chicago and moved into the slums, into the poorest neighborhoods in Chicago. And they started a program called End the Slums. And they were trying to have a mass campaign in the North. And they thought the South was bad. But in Chicago, whenever they marched, there was almost riots. He got a brick thrown right at his head. He cracked his head open. And that was a very violent uh, situation in Chicago. Eventually, they had to pull back from Chicago, and Jesse Jackson continued to, uh, to lead that movement. So at this time, there was also big race riots around the country. The, you know, the Vietnam War was unfolding, so there was all this tension in the country. And Dr. King you know, was a national figure kind of off in the middle of it. Um, so SNCC, you know, Student, non Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, ended up turning into a militant uh, black group. You know, the nation of Islam was on the rise. Um, so they criticized Dr. King, saying he was too passive, you know, the nonviolence wouldn't work anymore. But whenever they met him, they, under they respected him because how courageous he was, how brave he was. He would go into any situation, no matter what the violence was around him. And like our friend here was saying, you know, Dr. King was not afraid of death whatsoever. I mean, it wasn't a thing to him because he knew what he was involved in. He had already given his life to the movement. So there was no more life to take, you know? It's private life. Um, so 1967, this speech, you know, we already mentioned that uh, when he spoke out against the Vietnam War. His own organization, the president, uh, all, a lot of his funders, you know, no longer supported him. 
the FBI at this point started a campaign to destroy Dr. King. So J. Edgar Hoover was giving, uh, you know, in direct contact with the president about gathering information on Dr. King and his people and trying to, you know, find ways to tarnish his image, uh, make up stories about, you know, you know, sex and drug abuse by Dr. King and put that into the media. So it was an organized campaign to destroy Dr. King. And so much so that his uh, secretary of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, his own organization that handled all the communications, was on the FBI payroll. So they knew every step he was taking at this point, all the time. Uh, There's also other infiltrators by the FBI within his inner circle that were affecting decisions and gathering information from the FBI. So he was on constant surveillance. But Marty! What's up? No, Marty! Uh, Marty! So also this time, you know, 1967 uh, into 1968, he stuck. <laughs> You know, that guy, Bernard Lafayette, who I work with, he said, he tells the story this way. One day, Dr. King gave him a call and said, you know, Bernard, this is going to be our last Marty. campaign, and we're going for broke on this one. So I need you to come help me. And Dr. Lafayette later joked that when he said we're going for broke, he didn't mean they already were broke. By this time, they didn't have money to pay the staff people and very limited, you know, work in what they could do. But Dr. King also told him that they that that day that they needed to add another layer of executives to their organization because they were anticipating and planning for mass assassinations. So this is something they were going into it expecting not just himself to get assassinated, but mass assassinations from their entire leadership. So they were going all out at this point. How long was that before he was shot? This was, you know, uh, within the year that he was shot. So spoke out against the war, and then now they're organizing the poor people's campaign. So we kind of went very quickly on that point. Uh, yeah, so they're going all out. Uh, the organizing for the poor people's campaign turned out to be very difficult. So they're trying to get all sorts of people from all different communities around the country to come. You know, and for Dr. King called for an occupation of Washington D.C. and if necessary to completely shut down the U.S. government until poverty was eradicated. So at this time they're trying to push for a guaranteed salary for all people which would have the effect that no one would be poor, right? It's a pretty huge you know, redistribution of wealth and for an economic bill of rights, guaranteed housing, education, uh, health care. So they're going pretty full out here. But the organizing for it proved very difficult. Um, the campaign got delayed several times. And people like Cesar Chavez were involved. Uh, several of the indigenous uh, groups across the country were going to become involved. And Dr. King at this time was, you know, at the time they had the war on poverty, which, you know, was losing funding to the Vietnam War. They said Dr. King had a war on sleep. He wasn't sleeping much. At one point, he gave 35 speeches in seven days. Organizing for this campaign, so he was going as far as hard as he could for this, and still getting doubts from his own organization, from the administration, from some, some of his union people. So he became, you know, very stressed out and very, uh, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, depressed. Um, and at the, you know, this is just a side fact. When they did an autopsy after he got killed, he was but 38 or 39 when he was a sat when he was murdered. Robert Kennedy. He had the heart of a Robert 70 Kennedy. or 80 year old, because he was under that much stress. All right. Um, so at this time, there's uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, there's the uh, group of African American sanitation workers who went on strike because they had worked seven days a week, got paid, you know, below poverty wages and interrupt into a national campaign. So Dr. King saw that as a perfect opportunity to kind of uh, mold that movement to you know, spur in a greater national movement. And he was invited by James Lawson to come speak in Memphis, Tennessee and lead a national march. So uh, the first time he came to Tennessee, he delivered a speech in which he called for a general strike you know, in Memphis. Of all, no going to school, no going to work, which caused great excitement. It's kind of funny because the day for the general strike, there ended up being a blizzard, and this is in like March or April, that shut down the city. So they had a general strike, but not quite the one they were looking for. 
Um, but they came back for a huge march in Memphis. But you know, there's still that great uh, difficulty with the young uh, black militants and the gangs. And it resulted in this being this violent march where Dr. King had to leave it with riots and whatnot. So the headlines at this time where Dr. King comes in, causes violence, and leaves. He was not that popular, popularly received by the mass media at this point. He was, even though he's clearly about nonviolence, he was always labeled as someone that causes violence. An extremist, a communist. You know, people were, you know, the Red Scare is very serious at that time. So calling someone a communist had a very detrimental effect on his public image. Um, so they decided to go back to Memphis because they knew that, you know, you can't let violence stop you. That was their understanding of things. So they can't let the violence of one march stop the movement. So he, before he left, he talked to Coretta Scott, like, you know, should we really do this? And they talked about it, and they came to the conclusion that he was going to get killed soon if he continued with this. And Coretta Scott was a very strong woman. Coretta? Yes. And she told Dr. King, I know you're going to get killed, but you just have to keep fighting for this. And Coretta Scott King, she was really radical and against the Vietnam War. You know, Bernard Lafayette once was talking about Dr. King, all the reasons he was against the Vietnam War. And Bernard's wife hit me on the elbow and said, his wife made him do it. So Coretta <laughs> was really anti-Vietnam War, really pushed Dr. King in that direction. Um, so, of course, in Memphis, Tennessee, when he was assassinated, um, you know, we're going to listen to that speech in just a little bit. He wasn't supposed to make that speech. He was already, um, you know, in his pajamas, resting in the hotel, but he got a call from the church saying, you have to get down here because they, they need you. So it was pouring thunder, lightning when you deliver the speech. You actually hear the thunder sometime. And, and that just, before I move on, just why I remember these little antidotes. So Bernard Lafayette said he would try to catch Dr. King sleeping, but he would, when he fell asleep, Dr. King would still be working. And when he woke up, Dr. King would be showered, shaved, and in a suit ready to go. And he never saw Dr. King sleep. So he was, he was all out. But, uh, you know, when he was shot, um, you know, the, he had heavy police around him at all times, heavy surveillance. When he was assassinated, you know, about the half hour before he was assassinated, all the police cars, everyone disappeared from the scene. All his, you know, everyone doing surveillance on him, all the police that was tracking him just disappeared. Right. Yeah, you know. yeah, and the speech was very prophetic. If you stay to the end, I highly recommend it because he, because he saw it unfolding. Um, and later on that night, of course, he didn't sleep. He called his mom and talked to his mom for a while. And when he stepped on the balcony, he saw one of his favorite musicians walking by and asked him to play a particular tune very slow for him later on that evening. In the early 1990s, uh, the King family filed a lawsuit against the U.S. government, a civil suit, and a judge found that the federal government needed to award a financial settlement to the King family because the King family were able to prove in court that there was a conspiracy by the U.S. government to kill him. So, the courts, you know, found that. So. You know, basically, I just want to bring into his life in this little conversation, you know, that Dr. King was very radical towards the end of his life, particularly in that time. Um, even people in the militant movement who didn't respect necessarily his tactics still admired his courage. And he was very, you know, B.A. badass. He was warned to go. And you heard in the speech, he said, we need to stop this war, whatever type of protest you think you need. So he was, you know, he was respected by even uh, people in the moon that didn't respect his strategies. Um, and I just think that's really great to bring to light that, you know, he died on the day of the press conference at the Poor People's Campaign, right? Um, and then he, and he called for an occupation in Washington, D.C. and shutting down the government. And they, they did set up a resurrection city in Washington, D.C. after he died. That stayed for like a month and a half, but it never caught on. And it rained almost every day <laughs> of the Resurrection City. And I've heard that everyone assumed at the time that they're planning the clouds, you know, to make sure it rained to uh, keep that happening. But they did things like shut down, you know, uh, uh, 
intersections around Washington, D.C., try to shut down buildings, there's mass arrests, and also, you know, speak to Congress and lobby officials that way. Uh, so I just think it's very interesting that he died as that campaign was about to unfold. Maybe the country wasn't ready for it right there. But I think, you know, now that same energy is here calling for that, you know, this revolution of values in our country and, you know, valuing love and hate and generosity or greed. So I think it's really, you know, fitting that, you know, with the Occupy movement, you know, like kind of give a moment to respect Dr. King, where he was going, and see a reflection that was kind of taking that next step that he in his own life was starting to take. So um, that's all I have about that. I don't know if anyone has questions for myself. And Carly here is a non Kenyan non bounce trainer as well. Um, yeah. I have a question. Yes. Yeah, you said that the, the court determined that there was a conspiracy. Have you, is there uh, a government or uh, in that case, is there, like, I'd like to read that. Yeah, we should probably find that. That would be really interesting to read. And the family, you know, forgave the person that went in jail for being the assassin and publicly stated, you know, that this man didn't kill Dr. King. I'd like to see that on paper. I'd yeah. like to see the court's report. That would be really interesting right. to read. To find out how, what, what investigating was done and what, what the determinations were. How they came to their conclusions. Right. And Curtis Scott like led the push for that lawsuit. And Curtis Scott, you know, after he was killed, led the silent march in Memphis. She uh, Dr. King was gonna come out with this major speech, another major speech against the war, Ten Commandments on Vietnam, and she led that and she continued fighting, you know, the rest of her life. So but that would be interesting to get the court papers. Yeah. And it must be public record, right? Yeah, some yeah. Probably make it hard to find. The King Center today actually on their yeah, website. They the King Center made a million documents available online related to King's life. So you can read all their correspondence and their letters, how they're organizing the campaign. Maybe that's it. Yeah. Is there any other comments? Or? Um, so he says that one comment, I thought, I thought it's really important for me, like, kind of like that vision that he had at the end of his life when he was starting to get to move things towards, you know, more, you know, to try and ending poverty. And to where I think for me what that connects up is that so not only was he, you know, on a campaign against, you know, racial, racial prejudice, against white supremacy in the United States, which was what the United States was founded on, um, but also he was, you know, against, you know, again, against uh, class disparities, against poverty. So it's like when you connect up those two things, and I think that that's what the Occupy movement or, or that kind of global movement, if it's going to be successful, it's going to connect up both of those and not you know, not just focus on the economics of things to where we remember that, you know, if we're going to fight for a certain set of values that are like maybe middle class values, we're forgetting all of the, you know, all the struggles for racial equality, which were struggles of, for people, of, you know, for people of color who predominantly in working class and, and, and low. And so I think that that's kind of the most important thing for me, that, that kind of like what I think what you highlighted at the end, you kind of brought that back to more contemporary struggles too. Cool, and yeah, you know, he said, you know, the inseparable twin of racial injustice is economic injustice, and he tried to make that connection. And then, of course, you know, we kind of heard in the speech, you know, he's big time making the connection between the war, Vietnam, and poverty at home, and like militarism. And I think it's, I don't know, maybe you can make this more of a question. I mean, do you have a reason why, or did Martin Luther King ever give a reason why he never went into um, politics because for me, I, I mean, I, I think that's I think that's admirable because I don't I don't care whether you're, you go historically throughout this country when you're talking about Democrats or Republicans, they're all pro capitalists and they're all like perpetuating wars and they're all you know perpetuating you know exploitation. So I don't care which one you put in office. It's you know it seems like a, it's a more of a grassroots from below kind of thing. Maybe you can respond to that. Yeah. And, uh, so there were rumors at the end of his life that he was going to run for president or run for office. He was essentially told by uh, the Democratic Party of Georgia, you can be the senator, you can be the governor, you know, whatever <coughs> office you want, but he turned that down. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't, I can't remember specifically necessarily why he made that statement, but I know it was very clear from talking with Bernard Lafayette that going into politics wasn't something he was interested in, you know. He kind of almost like thrived, you know, when there was that energy and there was that conflict and the threat of like, you know, 
uncertainty in the moment. So I think he really oh. thrived off like movement and social movement, and, like excitement. You know, but that's a good point to bring up that he wasn't, you know, prepared to just go into the Democratic Party, which he could have, and been a, you know, successful politician. Anyone else have any comments or? Just a, a comment. Um, I saw it was Again. I think on PBS a documentary about Again. when he was killed, and um, they were trying to call the switchboard in that building to to get an ambulance there, and there was no no response from the switchboard. And what had happened was the lady who was the telephone operator at that time she heard that Dr. King had just been shot and she had a heart attack. So they were trying to call the switchboard and she was like, not responsive, you know. Right, and of course after they she died, in. there was mass riots all over the country. You know, it was really awful riots, um, which, you know, definitely, you know, it was kind of interesting. I was reading these books and like they're talking about how that really showed how much people actually cared for Dr. King, even though he was under so much criticism. When, people actually saw he got killed, you know, was the, all of those other riots were happening. It's like, wow, this is a guy that was actually about peace and love, and you killed that man. And it was very, you know, difficult on the nation. And it was, like, really unfortunate, like, some of the riots and whatnot. And, but, yeah, that, you know, eventually pushed the city of Memphis to, set it, to settle with the sanitation workers and allow them to be unionized. Um, so that national pressure that came on. But that's a good point to bring up about how shocking it was. That, and you know, so you know, Malcolm X, Martin, and then Robert Kennedy got killed during the Poor People's Campaign. So Bernard Lafayette told me that uh, you know if they had all lived, they were going to start working together and become like the three people to pull together the country and move in like a radical direction. Uh, Malcolm X and Dr. King shared the stage once. They put credit in between them as speakers, um, but uh, you know. Bernard Lafayette felt that they were going to start working together if they had both lived. You know, we already kind of prefaced it, and uh, yeah. But thanks everyone for coming out. All right. And this uh, Kingy and Nonviolence trains that we do, that's done like all over the country, all over the world. You know, we saw I saw this picture online where it's Gandhi telling Dr. King, you know, the funny thing about assassins. They think when they shoot you that they, you know, kill actually kill you. And I think we see that with, you know, we had this Kingy and Nonviolence workshop yesterday. They're being done all over the country this month. You know, Nigeria, they've done, you know, trained thousands in Kingy and Nonviolence. So his message still lives on and very blessed that we have this holiday to bring attention to him and his revolutionary spirit, you know, during these uh, revolutionary times.